Oh, try bringing there up the picture now. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah we, there's your yeah. photos. There you go. There you go. We can see it now. Okay. All right. Try this one. Take two. <laughs> sort of technology challenged, you know. I'm 100 years uh, out of date. So anyway, this is a, you can see this image of, uh, by uh, Silverhorn, huh? Kiowa prisoner of war. He looks like he's about to take an arrow by this Osage man down here. Okay. Um, so my talk tonight is the history of archery, the history of native archery of the Southwest USA. And by the Southwest, I mean Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, Utah, and adjoining desert areas of those states. And uh, I'm gonna use uh, the Southwest as a metaphor for the entire United States because Indians traded with each other. We know in the Southwest there are shells uh, that were traded from California. There were shells traded from Texas. There's turquoise got its way all the way down to Mexico. We know that from archeological finds and all kinds of things went back and forth. And it's hard for me to believe that there are some, uh, there might be some place that they didn't know about archery, but um, I think most things that one tribe had, another tribe, uh, you know, up to a thousand miles away or more, even 2000 miles away also had because the way people want to share things, and especially if it's a, a better technology. So um, in most talks, you build up to a conclusion. But tonight, I'm going to give you the conclusion right now. And then I'll use the talk to sort of support that. I believe that Native Americans reinvented the bow and arrow for themselves. And I'm going to show you why. Uh, a lot of other uh, people, writers, write about stone artifacts and the transition from uh, dart and atl, atl I hope everybody knows what that is. A dart is a giant arrow and an atl, atl is a stick with a hook on the end for throwing it that was used for a long time. And they try to differentiate between the two with even mathematical formulas and stuff. And I get tired, you know, and, and sleepy reading these things. But at any rate, we're going to, uh, my technique is to show you by uh, artifacts in the Southwest that uh, you can uh, study what most of the archeologists and most of the writers ignore, which is there are some of the oldest bow and arrow artifacts in the United States. There are the oldest bow and arrow artifacts in the United States in the Southwest. You don't need to rely on something as lame as trying to decide the difference between a dart point and an arrow point. It, in fact, in the historic period, it becomes very obvious the difference between those two. Let me see. Can you see my cursor? Yep. Okay, so I can use it to point to things. Absolutely. Okay, let's go back to, to the point zero in which people come to the new world. Let's just say that that date is 20,000 years ago. It's most assuredly, it's less, but it could be a little more. Uh, and I want to go to the old world, which, of course, the new world is from the Arctic on down into North America, Central America, and South America. That is the new world. Everywhere in there is the new world. The old world is everywhere else. So you have evidence of archery artifacts, and each little dot and dash is a little piece of evidence. And the farther back you go, you would expect the evidence to get slimmer and slimmer. However, uh, there's a weird thing about studying stone. At a certain point, there are no wood artifacts. And um, some things, little flint things with points on them, look begin to look like arrowheads to people who want to say that they found the oldest arrowheads there are. So there are, I mean, things could be anything from a tattoo making device or um, a little exacto knife. I mean, ancient peoples use little tiny knives and stuff. And so there's there's papers that say from Indonesia, there's archery artifacts at 30,000 years ago. There's some other little uh, findings. And then you go back to uh, a place in Africa where they found so-called arrowheads 
That's 63,000 years ago. So you should be wary uh, in all of my arguments and other people's arguments that there is evidence and there is proof. And if you find a, a bunch of little sharpened uh, flints in a, um, in a cave, you're not necessarily looking at arrowheads. I have to say also that if you put a chip of flint, a sharp chip of flint of any configuration, it doesn't have to have a point on it, of any configuration on an arrow, it's going to increase its uh, penetrating uh, value. So it's hard to say exactly what an arrowhead is. Uh, luckily, we won't have to do that. 15,000 years ago, at 20,000 years ago, when people came to the New World, they could have had access to bows and arrows. Um, but they, when they arrived, there is no evidence of bows and arrows. Um, Somebody else. Got gotcha. There is no evidence that they brought bows and arrows with them, but there is almost certain proof that they had dart and addle addle with them. So, uh, in the old world, right around eight thousand years ago, they found things in bogs in Denmark and Germany and, and Switzerland and stuff that are fabulously well-made bows from eight thousand years ago. So they're probably invention of the bow came from way past that time. It's possible that the Indians could have had bows and arrows when they came, they didn't find them useful. Uh, so they were not using bows and arrows. 10,000 years, no bows and arrows. Some slight outliers here. There's things where they found um, like in Canada of uh, somebody, uh, there's a screen in my screen. It's a little bit distracting. I wonder if it's able to take that out right there. Can you see that? What are you referring to? Sorry, we don't see it, Jack. We all his files. He's wanting to know how to take those files. Is that what you want? Oh, are his files. Yeah. Put a piece of tape over there. How does that? Okay, All right, that works. So here's the big enigma about American Indian archery. There is not certain, I mean, there's some outliers where people were, had bows and arrows long before uh, everybody else did. And these were merely the forerunners of archery. But about 500 AD, uh, 1,500 years ago, we have certain proof that archery was generally accepted in the Southwest. And that the great question is, look at the difference here. They say people came to, to uh, the New World uh, from, the, uh, from uh, uh, Polynesia, that they came from uh, other places, you know, to Japan and everything. All those places had bows and arrows before the Native Americans did. They had them for 10,000 years before the Native Americans. It's hard to believe that anybody could have visited and not told the Native Americans about this. I'm gonna move on before I beat this to death. Here's what they were making. I got this off the internet uh, 8,000 years ago in Europe. It's a wonderful, fully developed, modernish looking bow. It has a, it has a thick, narrow handle with an arrow pass and the uh, back and belly are both flat. This is Archery 101. And it's very complicated from an engineering standpoint. I'm not gonna burden you with a bunch of stuff, but you have to learn these two terms uh, to uh, understand the argument. So the back of the bow is the part that the archer does not see. The belly is what the archer is looking at. And if you just think of this as a person that's easy for the bow to bend toward the belly, it's very difficult and possibly damaging maybe catastrophically so to bend the bow in the opposite direction. So the back and the belly. If you read an article where the author uses things like the inside of the bow and the outside of the bow, this is a person who does not understand uh, the dynamics of archery. And a lot of archeologists, I'm sorry to say, write articles who do not understand archery at all. It's kind of like, you know, that men think that, that all men who, anybody who shot a bow is qualified to write about them. But I've read some pretty dismal stuff 
At any rate, the back and the belly, just think of it as a person, uh, the same configuration. Okay, that bow I showed you, the home guard bow from uh, Norway, I believe it is, has a flat back and a nearly flat belly. Uh, and what's going on in a bow is that the back is under tension and that the belly is under compression and you even out the tension by flattening the back. And so that's all the engineering I'm gonna get into for you to understand this argument, okay? And you'll notice that uh, even up here on the tips, they make them narrower. So this part's bending mostly, but they keep the back flat and uh, the belly rounded, which is okay. Let's go to Aztec Ruin at the Four Corners. And you see a very old bow, uh, which is nothing but like a large broom handle looking thing that's tapered on both ends. This is the most basic way you can make a bow. If it's any simpler than this, it's not identifiable as a bow. Then it's a stick. It's a walking stick or something like that. Here's the tips, no knocks on them. You see how hard this would be to identify. So this is a private collection from the, uh, um, the Temple Artifact Show. And here's a bow on the top. This is a very neat look. And you can tell by the eyes on here that this is a juniper, uh, a thin juniper tree. And I have seen these in Bandera County where the junipers are growing really dense. And, and in the shade, they grow very tall and thin trying to get to the light. And that's what they've done. They simply cut down this whole juniper tree. You can see it's just totally rounded and uh, tapered on the ends. Here's another one down here. It's got some rings like uh, painted on here as a decoration. This is as simple as you can make a bow. You cannot make a bow any simpler. And uh, a bow, uh, no matter how you do the woodwork, it will shoot the same as another bow that's made well. The thing is, it doesn't last very long because since it's round, the high part of the back is under extreme tension. And what happens, I'll tell you how 90% of all the bows die, is that a little sliver raises on the back that creates a weak place and it instantly becomes catastrophic and goes into the center of the bow and it bangs like a firecracker. But what happened was a splinter raised on the back. That's how bows die. This is one very nice bow from the No Man's Land Museum. And I investigated this bow. And uh, sometimes I have to think about things a long time, but I just realized a few days ago that this bow is made out of a very clever method. You see, it's mostly rounded too. I can't remember if it's square or round, but the, I read a paper how in Utah, people, Native Americans would attack a very large standing juniper tree and put a very large notch high up and then down low they would put another notch and they would take like uh, elk or deer antlers and they would split off a big pop out a big stave off of a living tree and work that into a bow. So I think this could very well be that because it lacks all the eyes and all the knots and everything and it could be made entirely of sap wood. At any rate, well worth seeing, though I think this could be one of those Utah style bows made from a living tree. And then the trees that they made these out of, even though the tree, the bows are hundreds of years old, there's a bunch of these trees still standing with giant places, you know, chiseled out of them. Here's more uh, of these bows all around, every one of them. They kept making these bows for 700 years without changing the style. And you see uh, the, the, in uh, the old world, they'd already moved uh, past this state 10,000 years minimum, maybe 15 or 20,000 years before this point right here. So there was nobody in the old world to teach them this technique. Even if the Indians didn't come with a bow and arrow, nobody came and taught them because nobody would have taught them to go back you know, 10,000 years in time. They would have taught them to make a rectangular type bow. Nevertheless, Indians didn't know better. They had to, to uh, tough it out and that's how they did it. Their arrows were almost all frag phragmites, which is a common reed. 
You've probably seen this in the ditches and stuff. It, right at this time of year, it has a little wispy foxtail for a bloom. There's another one that's called Arundo Donax, and they also call it corn plant because the uh, shape of the plant looks like corn. It kind of comes out curved and then heads up straight. It has corn leaves and has a, a great big, well-developed foxtail on it. Not, that's not the plant I mean, that's an import from China that must be like related. But at any rate, common reed was used for making almost every uh, ancient arrow uh, in the Southwest. Here's another display. This is from the Deming Luna Membrus Museum. You have a little kid's bow here. Same thing, round cross section. Here's another one, maybe adolescent, maybe type bow and all these. Uh, common reed arrows, phragmites. In Greek, it means to fence off because it used to have a tendency to fence off the rivers so you couldn't get to the rivers because the reeds were growing so densely. Uh, here's the bottom of them, the way they're decorated, and uh, they ground up stone. This is probably turquoise or malachite, one or the other, so these were pretty valuable. This would be hematite, which is an iron ore. You can find it soft as chalk in some places. They would grind it on a pallet, mix it with glue, and put it on here. And uh, the end of the cane would split, so it has a little a sinew lashing on it. This is an interesting technique. You can just barely see this little line. They took a dart of um, a little sliver of uh, wood out in three or four places, and then they uh, maybe put it in water and then wrapped it, and it makes the diameter shrink, you see? So it makes it easier on their fingers. And some of them, they made kind of an hourglass shape thing. I don't see, this one's not hourglass. Sometimes it flares here in the back. But you can see that their uh, fletchings, you see this one held back the back of the quill. Here's the front of the quill. So this isn't even two inches. The Anasazis use very short kind of uh, whatever rounded type fletchings. Every one of them common read. And the other thing is people are, are so fascinated by arrowheads, they don't know that a lot of the ancients didn't put uh, stone arrowheads on their, on their arrows. Uh, you know, it's been shown by archeologists that some uh, Anasazis, I use that term still, it's fallen into disfavor. People say ancestral Pueblo, but it doesn't have the same cachet and still books are filled with the word Anasazi. So I use them interchangeably. And they, they uh, here's the cane would go right here, you see. And this is inserted into the hole of the cane and then it has a lashing here, uh, sinew lashing. Sinew means dried tendon. And uh, they sharpened it like a pencil after a while, it got kind of blunt. But these folks were living on prairie dogs, birds, snakes, lizards, um, rabbits. And very rarely, uh, there were too many hunters out there among the ancients. And, and by the time you chased one deer out of your territory, he was in somebody else's territory. And there just weren't a lot of deer uh, uh, that are found in the faunal remains compared to like prairie dogs. They were living on small things. And the arrowheads are very tiny. Uh, you can kind of tell something about the diameter. See, these are basket makers. So this is right at the time of the invention of the bow and arrow. And uh, the shaft uh, would have to be not too much larger or not too much smaller than this space here between the notches or tying with sinew doesn't really work that good. Maybe some of them didn't work that good. Uh, but then they had other things. They call this an arrowhead. It looks the same, but this could have been a drill. You see, it's very blunt. And uh, this is what an arrowhead really looks like. This one, like right here, this one here. You know, these could be arrowheads. Uh, it depends on the size. An arrowhead shouldn't be more uh, than an inch long. And most of them were half to three quarters of an inch long. So they were like a small caliber uh, rifle you know, technology instead of a great big broadhead. Those don't work well. Any archer who has a bow that's not, you know, a Tarzan-like bow, but just a, a bow that you could make out of a stick that's not going to break and shooting a cane arrow, you don't want a great big heavy arrowhead. And the Indians knew that. Here's a fantastic collection. I think this is from the no man's land. 
I included that just so you can see, these are like mostly alabates and, uh, but they're, they're all really small. You see, you put this on a very small, if this is the diameter of the arrow and the barbs are only sticking out like, uh, you know, an eighth of an inch or so like that. These are very typical arrowheads. 500, uh, these are probably later. These could be Antelope Creek, could be as late as 1400. But at any rate, uh, these others are uh, 500 AD from the beginning of archery. And you see they haven't changed too much by the time you get past 1200. So at any rate, from 500 to 1000, or 1200, the bow doesn't change, or the arrow is the same thing, a round cross-section bow and a cane arrow. Okay, uh, this is a really good text uh, on caves of the Upper Gila and Waco Tanks area. So uh, I have to digress a minute. The reason we find so many great archery artifacts in the Southwest is because of the religious practice of those people. And when somebody died, they would bury them or put them in a cave or put them in an overhang and seal it up. And in their thinking, the person's spirit would stay there for a few days and then it would pass to the next level of existence, whatever that level is, happy hunting ground or whatever you want to call it. And in their thinking, that life was just like this life and people continue to doing the same things in the next life that they do in this life. And, um, Wherever a cave is, is like a portal to the underworld because they thought that the next world was underneath this world. And so in the same way, they thought, well, maybe Uncle Ned needs a bow. Okay, well, my bow broke, but Uncle Ned broke and we put him in the ground. So if we take this to a cave in our territory, this broken bow, and put it in a, a and put it in the cave, then that the spirit of the bow, not the actual bow, but the spirit of the bow will go to the next world and Uncle Ned will get to use it. Well, in this one, they found that people were coming from miles and miles around to bring arrows to a cave and put them in the cave. And they found like a hundred arrows and they're so fantastic. See, here's that hourglass shape uh, created by reducing the diameter a little bit and then leaving the original diameter. But look at all these beautiful designs that they put on these things. All of these intended to go to their relatives in the spirit world. So, and there's, this isn't the only cache in the Waco tanks. They found one in uh, Goat, Goat Canyon, I think, in uh, the Davis or the Guadalupe Mountains. They found one at uh, a large cache at the Ghost Ranch uh, near Abiquiu, and they found one in Mexico. I've forgotten where that one, one was, and there was another one at Gila in the Gila Mountains. There was a big cache of bows and arrows there. Uh, the bows were probably too valuable to put a good one in there, but somebody got the idea, oh, if the bow died, we'll send the bow on, see? So that was their thinking. So that's why we have all these. There's hundreds of these bows. You don't have to study flint arrowheads to get a picture of bows and arrows in the Southwest. We have the bows and arrows. I don't know why they don't write about them. When I go to museums, every museum has something like the, like the No Man's Museum has two fine bows and arrows that we can put probable dates on. Um, so here's, this is from a book, Spirit of the Arts by Forrest Fenn. Some of you people might recognize his name. He was a famous uh, dealer in, um, in uh, Santa Fe. My telephone, sorry. I'm gonna toss it in the other room. <laughs> oh. He was a famous dealer in Santa Fe and he bought these things. Unfortunately, we don't know where these are from. This one is, um, <sighs> this one is a, what we call a cave bow, which is the earliest form. This one, they, they figured out that if you put little bandages all over it, that you could uh, keep it from exploding if a splinter raised up. 
So that's an intermediate step. And you remember the others had designs. And so it has something to do with the designs also. And this one is really the most fascinating bow I've ever seen from the Southwest. This is a bow, which is a round cross section, but at the top of the bow, it has a sinew cable, like a twisted sinew cable. And all these bandages simply hold that cable on. And what this represents to me is a bow from the Arctic, the earliest back bows in the Southwest. Instead of gluing the tendon on, uh, directly onto the bow, they made cables, and they did this all the way into the into the 20th century in Alaska and whatnot in Canada. And uh, this this uh, gives it some extra zap, and really is qualitatively different than this bow right here. We don't know where this bow came from. We'll never know. It's in. I think I know another private collection that this is in, but these typically don't come with stories. Uh, so unfortunately, we'll never know what this came from. It doesn't really matter because there were Apaches and Navajos all over the Southwest. And these people most likely are the ones who brought these bows from the Arctic. They call them Athapascans because they speak the same language as Canadians do today, Navajos and Apaches very similar, maybe a dialectical difference. So at any rate, this bow from the 12 or the 1400s, you can see it's just a different animal than this thing here. Uh, this is uh, the University of uh, Utah. And this is a find from Promontory Cave. And this cave is famous for having 250 used moccasins, which are stored in this cave. And if you're a moccasin lover, when you look at those moccasins, you can say these people were Canadian. This is a Canadian pattern. There is no confounding it or maybe or anything like that. And uh, in the same cave, they found this common cane arrow. But now instead of having those little tiny short feathers like an Anasazi, a Pueblo ancestor bow, it's got a great big long fletch like a plains bow, a plains arrow, but it's still made on a common cane shaft. And here's some more sections of those. So they probably learned that in the Southwest. This is a hybrid arrow, part Southwest, part Alaska. Only one I've ever seen. There must be others out there somewhere, but. Now we're gonna go to, I'm gonna call this about 1400 or 1450. This is a, K, a, a Kiva painting from Awadavi, which is a famous place uh, in, on the Hopi uh, reservation. And we don't know exactly what this means, but this man here is holding a double curved bow. So something happened to the shape of the bow. It's no longer just a single curve. Now it's got a double curve. And this is the kind of bows that they put tendon on the back of. It means something spiritual to them. I'm not sure what the purpose. Uh, it, could, it could be shaped otherwise, but they like this shape. And this quiver is very interesting. This is the oldest representation that I know of, of a mountain lion quiver. It's yellow like a mountain lion. Uh, if you case the skin of a mountain lion, you, you make a cut between the back legs and you peel the thing off like a pair of pajamas off of a kid. You cut the head off and sew up the, the, the legs, but leave the tail. The tail is the diagnostic thing. There's only two things on a, on a quiver that makes a tail. One is a mountain lion and one is, is an otter, a river otter. They're both extremely desirable. But in the Southwest, this kind of says you're a, you're a first class hunter. And here's his arrows with uh, barred feathers. Well, turkeys have barred feathers, but so do most of the hawks have barred feathers. So let's say this, this, could, be, this could be a little later, but I'm gonna say this is from about 1450, uh, mural painting. Another, now it shows it has a carrying strap on it, but highly stylized, but still with the tail, it's a mountain lion. It's no more highly stylized than any of the other stuff going on here. Those are supposed to be feathers there. Don't ask me. You have to ask the guy who painted it. One more, mountain lion quiver with a carrying strap. 
1400s, let's say. By this time, the ancestral Pueblos have stopped leaving uh, bows and arrows in caves, generally speaking. I can't say why. Uh, it's just no longer uh, practiced by them. You know how uh, people's thinking changes over time. So now we're moving up to uh, modern times. This is actually historic. Uh, they've now joined a bow case. So you don't have to carry the bow individually. And here's the sash has been lengthened. So you can put it over like, let's say winter clothing. Like if you're out hunting and you've got a, a, a animal robe over you, you can put this over all that. You know, it's got a little stiffener here, which kind of keep, helps keep the arrow straight. This is actually backwards because it, the bow case should be facing to the left and the arrows also with the bow case on top because the first thing you do is pull the bow out and string it. And at that point, the bow case is attached here and here, and then it just droops down. Both, both sides of it droop down out of the way. Now the quiver is available to you and you commence. Uh, Indian tanned leather. I don't know if any of y'all do crafting, you just can't beat uh, hand, handmade leather, handmade deer hide. It's from heaven to work with. It's just wonderful, it lasts forever besides. Okay, this one's Apache. We're now 1800s, huh? I kind of swept through this pretty quick, but anyhow, uh, Apaches are known for making these little cutouts uh, on the leather work. They also sometimes have very fancy shaped fringes and stuff. This one's typical. They've simply flipped the bow case over. The bow, the bow case should actually, you know, the way it naturally lays, would lay over the quiver with the sash coming between the two of them. And all this stuff is made super heavy duty because by now they're all riding on horses. And anything you put on a horse, if you've ridden horses, you know stuff has to be built really well or it's not gonna last very long. So their stuff is, is built good. This is Apache. Wasn't long before Pueblo started making this kind of stuff, where if you find a good double curve bow, it's hard to tell uh, what tribe made it. Another Apache, they have this device in the middle called a boot. And remember, they have sometimes fancy fringes, but uh, put backing with red cloth and having this here, this is probably easy in the reservation period. And then the museum people sort of pull the arrows out because they want to see the arrows. But in Apache quivers, a lot of times the arrows completely disappear inside the quiver. You can see how long this quiver is. Nobody's going to be shooting a three foot arrow with a plains bow. The arrows are like more like two feet or 26 inches, you know. Apache, uh, historic uh, uh, reservation period. Uh, Gilcrease Museum, double curve bow, but. Um, probably not backed. I think it was a self bow. It's a hard to get a uh, self bow into this shape. But, and uh, does it shoot better? No, it doesn't shoot better than a single curve bow, but they, they liked it. It gave them power. Maybe it meant lightning or something like that. Uh, arrows. By 1700s, late 1700s, Indians are starting to make their own metal arrowheads. People call them trade points, but there's just too much evidence out there that they were making these things themselves. A uh, double curve sinew backed bow at the Panhandle Plains Museum. Nice, no way to tell what tribe. Maybe the card says there, I don't know. It doesn't make any difference. A Pueblo, uh, Apache, uh, Southern Cheyenne, uh, probably Wichita's. Uh, Others would, would have that bow shape. Double curved bow, this is in the, in the Gila Museum. I think it said this one was Apache. Look at those very prominent steel points. This, this museum is a real gem. If you ever get by there, it's in Perryton, Texas. And uh, Perryton is near, um, the Blanco Canyon of the White River. And it's a site, I, I knew this man who collected all these things. He said he'd never used a, a metal detector. 
he was in his 80s. He passed away this year and he donated all this stuff to the museum. And he would just, him and his friends found 60 something sites, everything from Civil War, uh, Indian War, cavalry and Indians, Indians against Indians. One of his neighbors, we stood on the, on the rim of the, of the Blanco Canyon. He said, you see those grove of trees over there about a mile away? I said, yes, I do. He said, that's where Coronado spent the winter of 1542. Those artifacts are in the Smithsonian today. You can see these things are made out of anything, but we'll get, we'll get to it more specifically. They liked um, the, the hoops on water barrels, on old water barrels. And there was even a formula by which they uh, made those. And they, they, um, they took a, a chisel and chiseled this out and then filed and filed it. And I said, well, you got to have a hammer. You can't use a rock. OK, well, we found those. They were uh, using these um, uh, roofing hatchets because back in the day, all the roofs were made out of shingles. And even a buffalo hunter, if he was going to build a shack or something, needed some kind of roofing on it. And so, you know, uh, traders, uh, sutlers back then used to sell roofing hatchets. And they found one at this site here. I was like, oh, my gosh, it's a smoking gun of of uh, Native American uh, manufacturing. This one here is made out of sterling silver. It was either a spoon or a fork. I was so thrilled. If you're gonna kill a vampire, you need one of these guys. If you don't have a, a, a gun with a silver bullet, you need a silver arrowhead. And then a whole bunch of them, uh, they were trading Indians uh, brass cooking pots because they loved to boil meat because you'd get all of the juice and nutrients out of out of it. But uh, we are scraping it with a spoon and everything. And one day it develops a hole. The Indians didn't have any soldering technique. They didn't know how to do that. So they took the pots and started chiseling them up and cutting them up. And I, th I believe all these are brass in this ring, silver in the middle and iron on the outside. Uh, Perryton Museum, not to be missed if you like uh, historic, if you want to see the whole story. Uh, this one hit either a rock or something steel and kind of rolled up. Uh, the uh, I don't think those barrel hoops are, are high quality steel. They could even be just iron because he used to make uh, things out of like uh, buggy wheels and stuff out of iron. But people say Indians were we're heating them up and hammering them. I, that's not true. I've looked at thousands of arrowheads and I've seen almost none of them were have any forge marks on them. To do that, you'd need tongs and you'd need a, a little anvil and a, and a hammer and all that. And they, they just didn't have that stuff. They were, you know, I, I told my friend, well, what were they using for an anvil? And the consensus is that they have found uh, large ax heads and they were using the face of the ax head for an anvil. They were, could have used that roofing hatchet to have a hammerhead on one side. And at that site, Perryton, there's even a bunch of uh, chisels and, um, and files. A file, you couldn't sharpen a saw without a file. So, you know, it was just a common thing that, that, uh, that those guys would have. These are just uh, some unprovenanced planes arrows with the metal point, very thin. Very long fletching, sometimes. Hematite, green, uh, I don't know. There's a green mud. They used to put uh, blue dye into uh, laundry for white clothes because a little bit of tinge of blue made them look cleaner. So they would have packages of powdered blue and uh, Indians bought that from a long time ago. And all you got to do is start selling them. And they're like, the Indians had and could be convinced to go out and, and trap furs, especially beavers, were like a fortune. If you can get them back to St. Louis, they shaved the hair off and made felt hats out of them. Buffalo hides were used. The people were riding in wagons and open wagons in the winter and, and uh, they were freezing. So a buffalo hide, if three people were on a buckboard, uh, one buffalo hide would cover all their, all three of them's lap and legs. So all you needed is a coat after that. And it just made it much more comfortable. So there was a, just a lively market for hides and stuff from the Indians. And, and if they were into trapping and processing stuff, they could, they could get the, the tools that they needed. 
to make their own arrowheads. They liked them rounded. If you make them needle sharp, they get stuck in bone sometime, but if you round the point, it hits a bone, it sort of bounces off and keeps going. These are from the Smithsonian. They're from a, a Comanche battle site. I forget the name of them. Uh, Smithsonian, everything they have, I think they have 50,000 objects and they're all online. So, you know, you just, you can spend your lifetime just cruising this Smithsonian website. Off a of battlefield, doesn't get any better. This one, I forget what tribe this is, but you develop a taste for beadwork on plain stuff because uh, that's what the best ones have. And this is the arrow case. This one has a little flap. It looks like it was sewn on later so the arrows could be covered over for the weather and the bow would stick out of the bow case. It had to, because it was like a gun. You wanted to go for it real quick and, uh, and be able to string it and, and shoot. Uh, Indian tan leather, beadwork, sinew sewn probably. This one, Cheyenne. The owner said, this is not exactly correct. It was made out of something else. But I'm like, well, you didn't know that the Indian didn't recycle a woman's legging, is what I heard said, and then make this quiver and bow case. I don't see the big problem. Nice beadwork, huh? Good old colors. Modern colors don't look like this. You have to search out these old time colors, pink, this uh, greasy yellow, cobalt, turquoise, different size beads, different, probably different country manufacturer. Here's the best quiver ever made. This one, they say is Comanche, it used to be in the Charlie Eagle Plume collection. In Colorado, it's made out of a jaguar skin. And the text is total nonsense. This person doesn't have a prayer of what they're talking about, but the, uh, the quiver and bow case are good. You can see it's had a lot of wear and tear. It's, it's very tasteful, the uh, coordinating uh, beadwork. It has a, a lining, a cloth lining. Here's the tail, the jaguar, and the sash has come loose. Somehow this African spear has become associated with this quiver. The people won't let go and just see that it's a museum mistake of, you know, labels on museum things used to be put on with a piece of cotton string and probably with iron, they could rust and whatever. Nevertheless, the tags would fall off and they'd, things would get confused. So at any rate, that's probably the story there. Best quiver ever made, Comanche. Gila cliff dwellings. Bow with no point. I mean, an arrow with no point. Decorated now. Apaches. Uh, started going to World's Fair exp expositions, one in uh, uh, 1893 and the other one in uh, 1898, I believe, in the Chicago, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And they found out that anything that had decoration on it sold better than something that was plain. So they started decorating all kinds of stuff, including bows. So I've seen several of these in the, the uh, no Man's Land has one of those bows, but nevertheless, they were made by prisoners of war who were only a few years recently out, you know, uh, as free roaming warriors of the plains. These are two ute bows. Arrows not necessarily associated with the bows. These are completely sinewed. You can't see that there. I'll see another picture. Uh, the sinew goes over this groove on the top and then gets bound down because it'll pop off if it's not if the sinew is not tied down. It becomes like a big strap or something that's glued onto the bow. There's another double curve bow. It's lost some of its symmetry. It goes sinew goes over the back, through the groove onto the belly, and then lashed in place with more sinew. And it's got, it had glue on it and dirt and grime gets caught on it. If you have to find the sinew string, that's a real plus. This is one made by um, Reginald Laban. Uh, he's not an Indian, but he followed Indian stuff his whole life. And this is a mountain lion skin quiver. Uh, this is a University of uh, Illinois at Cham Champaign. And I uh, just included it here so you get to see what a mountain lion has that sort of yellowish look beadwork. This is all modern-ish, circa 1950. 
got the claws. The Quanta Parker, last chief of the Comanches, now they have chairmans, got a really short bow. Nice arrows with longish fletchings. I was in the uh, Farm and Ranch Heritage Museum in Abilene. They had his bow on display, the temporary thing. You see, this bow is not rounded. It's completely flat on the back and it's actually rectangular. It's about twice as wide as it is, I mean, twice as wide as it is thick. And it's nothing but a rectangle. The corners are a little rounded, but it's a rectangle from one end to the other. And here you can see these diagonal marks and those are put on there by a blacksmith rasp. So although Quanta Parker was living on the reservation then, you know, the Indians still did this kind of thing. And uh, I use uh, rasp like that now. The blacksmith rasp is a little brutal, but it was such a common tool in the day. You could get it. Anybody who sold supplies would have to have a blacksmith rasp. A farrier couldn't make it, you know, if he couldn't find a new black new rasp. Uh, from time to time, they they uh, they uh, uh, cleaned up the horses' hooves with that and reshaped them. There's his arrows, Quanta Parker's. Quanta Parker should know what a good arrow looks like. A little blue, greenish blue here, red, red tail hawk. Uh, ferruginous hawk, uh, red tail wing, possibly. There's more of the ferruginous. These two went together. So I'm going to wind up with uh, one of my favorite people. Uh, hunting horse was the youngest Kiowa scout, the last one hired. He was only hired as a scout for four months before they disbanded the Kiowa scouts. Here he is with his seven, uh, six girls and one son. His two wives, his two, two sisters he married. You have more harmony if you marry two related women and they're not jealous of each other. You can see he was quite a handsome man when he was young. This is an early 20th century. He was an archer. He used to uh, give demonstrations of archery uh, and this is his Osage bow. It has a little uh, tuft of horsehair up here. You can see it has a weak place right here. It's bending just a little too much. It's unlike this one here, his arrows. Here's that bow. It's, it's in my friend's family collection. The, one of these bandages, this one here, covers an actual kind of a little split down there. And this one he added just to sort of balance it out so it didn't look like a a bandage, and it says, you know, see file marks on it. This is all reservation period, but still, uh, sinew string, bandage. He was born in 1846, according to the military, but they didn't have birth certificates out on the Medicine Creek in Kansas at that time. But uh, he remembered, everybody said it was a particularly severe winter and that Kyle was kept a winter count and that was supposed to be 1846. At any rate, he died in 1953. Do the math, the guy was 107 years old when he died. He had to send five buses for all of his relatives to come to the funeral. So at any rate, hopefully, Archery would be good for your longevity. So maybe you should consider taking up archery and, you know, learning to shoot at targets and stuff or whatever. So I think that's all I have. I wonder how I can go to the full screen. Do you have time for some questions, Jack? Do you want to entertain some questions? I would like all the questions you can you can stand. All right, fair enough. Um, I, I had a couple, I guess I'll start off. If um, because I had a couple that I, I thought up. So are you, I guess, by prelude, is, are you, what have you, what do you think about the recent finding of the tracks in southern New Mexico, the human tracks that are supposed to be the, the oldest record of humans in North America? Have you heard about I've, this? I've seen that story. Uh, if you were an archaeologist, you would want your name associated with the oldest tracks in the United States. But the archaeologists are some of the most skeptical people in the whole world. So 
you know, it will take some years for that to play out. Uh, right. Some of them just can't offer enough proof for the skeptics. You know what I mean? It just, you know, I don't know. I have no opinion about that. All right. Well, then that was, then I have a follow-up question. I was going to see what you thought about that. Then if those do hold up, to kind of get back to your central thesis, I think, too, that you said as well, is it possible then, you said that you think the Native Americans, right, invented the bow on their own, right? They, invent, they didn't bring it from the old world or no one taught them how to do it, right? I'm but the only sure. one. I'm the yeah. only one who thinks that. And I've, right. come, I've come to that conclusion in the last few years. It was, yeah, exactly. There was nobody to teach them that kind of technology. They were, you know, it's just, it's crazy. Yeah. So is it possible then, right, that they may, if they came over much earlier than we thought, is it possible they came over before there were bows in Asia and places like that? That was then what I was leading up to, what I was building up to. Well, Seth, that requires a lot of speculation. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sort of, I'm a skeptic myself. I'm sort of reality based and there's, there's nothing, there's nothing to demonstrate. I've heard that, you know, even some famous people have said that uh, Indians were here a hundred thousand years ago, but um, nobody came to visit. Nobody showed them, you know, and why, if they, if they've been here that long, why, you know, why didn't they have a bow and arrow? Why it doesn't seem like they'd reject it on the way, would it? Would it? But I don't know. Maybe maybe it was such cold weather it wasn't useful during the Paleo times. But people in historic times used bows and arrows in Siberia. Siberia is a gold mine for wonderful archery artifacts in various museums. So yeah. I, I have no opinion on what you're. Yeah, what you're fair thinking. enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah, I, I have a question. Uh, you, mentioned, you mentioned uh, several pairs of moccasins found in the cave. Uh, and how old did they think those moccasins were? Uh, I, I think I told you what I know about it, that they're probably from between 12 and 1400. I don't know that they've been radio... I don't think you can radiocarbon date something that's uh, 500 years old. I think it has to be older than that. Uh, but uh, artistically, I, th I think it's, uh, there isn't a lot of conjecture on that. They're Canadian style moccasins from 12 to 1400 AD. So what, what kind of skins do they, were they made of? Uh, they look like they're made out of some kind of deer skin, but uh, they could also, the ones I saw, there were about 12 of them on display. They'd been repaired multiple times. Mostly they'd worn through the soles and then they'd crudely attached new soles to them. But uh, if the, uh, you know, if the uh, native tanned uh, uh, bison hide looks a lot like uh, moose, moose and, uh, elk hide. It's hard to tell those two apart. Deer, deer hide is qual qualitatively different than uh, moose or bison hide, but uh, uh, I think I remember uh, there's a reproduction of one of them. They, they reproduced it in uh, uh, some kind of deer hide, might be white tail or could even be caribou, I'm not sure. Yeah. It's a fascinating, it's a, you know, it's a, for some moccasin person, It'd make a whole presentation all by itself. 250 moccasins. I mean, it's just, and no two of them are identical. Look like just a whole gang of people. They left them there in case they ever you ran out of supplies. They could go back to their cave and get their old moccasins back. And they probably were in a new place and there were a lot of game. And so everybody got a new pair of moccasins. They were there for a few months and everybody got re-equipped and there was plenty to eat and they just stayed there before they moved on. And what they found was good too. So they never had to go back. Maybe there was a pair under the Christmas tree, huh? Yeah, exactly. Promontory Cave. You can look it up and read about it. Yep. Anybody here make bows and arrows? Did they use a lot of bow darts in this area to make bows? Not in the Southwest. 
They can grab the panhandle of Oklahoma. Excuse me? In the panhandle of Oklahoma, did they use bow dart, bow dart trees to make the bow? I would guess not. I would guess they're using other woods. The original range of uh, Bodark, according to a, uh, a, a very well-known uh, archaeologist that I know, is from uh, a creek on the south of Dallas, and that it got spread all over the United States during the Depression because uh, it has thorns on it, and they were selling it for like a poor man's hedge plant that the cattle didn't like to go through. So you find Bodark all over right now. But uh, nobody's planting it anymore. So it, it's uh, just those places it got to during the Depression. I mean, I understand there's some near y'all, but I doubt if you could make uh, too many bows out of it. Uh, Bodark in dry areas puts out a terrific number of branches and some of the ugliest wood you ever saw. So you need something with straight grain. Uh, uh, Bodark will drive you crazy building a bow dark bow you have to have something sort of decent to start out with or you'll you'll just drive yourself mad and you won't have a very good looking bow when you're finished a lot of apaches never gave up using river cane they went ahead and used that common cane uh right up to the reservation period because there also wasn't a lot of good um uh, arrow making material i'll have to show you there's other indians in the Southwest who made what they call compound arrows, which is like the Anasazi ones where you have put two pieces of wood together, but you lengthen out the foreshaft to, you know, a foot or something like that, or maybe a little less and reduce the cane to about a foot or, or a little more. And so the main shaft, the cane, isn't so much bigger than the foreshaft. You make a perfectly good arrow out of two pieces of nonsense and somehow it goes together, makes a really good arrow. They're also uh, very nicely weighted in the front with the hard, you know, hardwood foreshaft in the front and the uh, cane arrow in back and um, the weight works good. So, so Jack, you, you mentioned something about they use some glues to glue sinew on or whatever. What, what, how did they use, what glue did they use? What did they use? The oldest glue I've seen is a uh, bee weed glue. If you know a bee weed, or you can look that plant up, you collect bee, bee like a bee, B E E. Yep, like a bumblebee. Yeah. Uh, you uh, collect that plant and you put it in uh, hot water and just boil it and boil it. And the water turns red, and after a while, you fish out all the sticks and throw them away and boil that down until it's tar. And the other use for that is uh, uh, ceramics makers used to uh, uh, use that to create black because when you when it burns onto the pot, it um, there's actually sugars in there that um, that turn the uh, they they would uh, paint on white paint and then put on the bee weed and um, when you fire it, it turns the bee weed black. And the third thing is that the bee weed in an emergency was actually edible. And you could eat your little cake of, um, of glue if you had to. And uh, Anasazis used to lay that down, slather it on the arrows uh, before they put the, the fletchings on and stick the fletchings into just a, a reddened area on the, on the arrow. So the, bee, uh, the bee weed was native to the Southwest then? Oh yeah, bee weed grows along all the highways and roads. It's an extremely common plant in the Southwest. Um, in historic times, they were uh, using hide glue. You can take any animal and its skin will be 100% collagen and you put it in hot water and uh, uh, take off the hair, but keep the raw hide and cook that down and you have hide glue a very high quality. They also use that for putting the sinew onto a bow and you use it to uh, for the fletchings. Uh, often uh, Indians carried what's called a glue stick where as it was hardening, they would wind it onto a stick and get it real goopy and then let that thing dry out perfectly well. And then later when you needed some glue, you take out your glue stick out of your quiver and you put a little water on it and then heat it up and the uh, heat 
makes the uh, water penetrate the glue and it comes alive again. And then you uh, wipe that glue off the glue stick onto whatever it is you're gluing. I have to say one more thing, if you can stand it, that um, a lot of cave bows have red glue spattered on them like blood. And um, I don't think anybody, I've never heard anybody notice this, but I've noticed it looking at a lot of old cave bows. A lot of them have a bee weed glue splattered on them as if the bow was bleeding. So I think that's kind of an interesting little thing. I made uh, bee weed glue one time myself. It's not that hard. They have sort of lavender blossoms is how you know them. Anyway. Everything you never knew. And I've, I've even held back. I've kept it at the 101 level. Archery, bow making is, can be extremely complicated. I mean, even engineers write uh, uh, engineering formulas about how a bow works and stuff. And uh, everybody gets lost sooner or later in those kind of things. But you know, it doesn't have to be that complicated. It's extremely interesting. Thank you very much. I hope. Hope you enjoyed it. I just love love bows and arrows. It's so fascinating that something that's so simple can just throw that arrow out there so quickly and you know make a uh, a good device. They're wonderful. I love them. Ever since I was a kid, I was captured by them. But I like the real feathers and the real sticks and yeah. and the real sinew and stuff. You know, I don't. Uh, I, I acknowledge the uh, synthetic stuff, but uh, it just doesn't warm my soul like uh, you know feathers too. Anybody else? Jack? Yes. I, I might make a comment. Um, you mentioned Blanco Canyon down uh, uh, south of Perryton. Uh, my grandparents' ranch and farm was in the family for almost 100 years, just about six miles north of Crosbyton that spilled down into Blanco Canyon. And as a kid, I spent every free moment I could looking for what I thought called dinosaur bones, but they mostly were all bison bones. And, but I was also acutely aware of all the arrowheads that they had found around in the area and at the Crosbyton Museum. And what was really peculiar was all my searching and looking for treasures down in the canyons. I never found but one piece of flint, but I did find a bison vertebrae that I dug out of the side that had a burnt corner on it. So I, 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 it's just peculiar to me how th there didn't seem to be any traces of flint or arrowheads down in the river, but you, you could find evidence that the Indians who had been down there and there would be burnt uh, ashes with little uh, seed berry husks uh, mixed in with the ashes. So, so, and it, 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 I don't know if, if you, you probably know this, but that is just a few miles from Floyd Data, and that was right by where uh, they found a piece of chain mail from Coronado's expedition. And it's the glove, the chain mail glove is in the Floyd Data Museum down there. No, the, they have chain mail. That chain mail glove is in the Smithsonian. Did you know Choice Smith? Uh, no, I don't believe so. He lived, uh, he was born and raised on the, on the rim of the Blanco Canyon. He's from Floyd Ada. On the east side or the west side? Or, or I'll ask my mom. I'll bet she knows because she grew up there as a kid. But, He's a cotton farmer. <laughs> right on the rim. You could just walk to the edge of his property and, you, and look down into the canyon there. All that stuff is his, his personal collection. Well, they've, they've got a bunch of uh, crossbow bolt heads from the Spaniards uh, there in the museum and a piece of that uh, chainmail glove. It's, I've seen it in the uh, case there in Floyd Data. Okay, well, there was a lot of chainmail. They have a uh, Spanish conquistador uh, horse tack and a lot of stuff. It's a, it's a great museum. It's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Questions? Comments? Say all these uh, all these pros and uh, bulletin points are all been spear points. Is that correct? Did you hear what he said, Jack? No, I didn't. 
the focal point and the uh, the focal point and the closest points are all sphere points, right? They are uh, dark points. Uh, lamps. Yeah. yeah. Well, yes. Uh, the atlatl through the dart. The dart is just a giant arrow, like a miniature javelin. A, la a lance point, which uh, is not thrown, but is just thrust. Like it, once the animal is kind of wounded and you got him mired down, you, you attack him with a lance. Or they are um, knife blades. It's very difficult at some point. Some of them were started their life as one thing and ended up their life as another. So it's hard to you sort of measure across at the point of attachment. And if it's as wide as a broom handle, then it's a knife. If it's narrower, then it might be something else. So, but clo Clovis were both knives and darts. It could be Lance too. So it's very hard to tell. On the invitation, where you sent those out, none of those is an arrowhead. They're all so big. They're all uh, knife, dart, or lance points. The, all that little, that case with all those little tiny points, Seth, those are your arrowhead. And people call them bird points. That's a bunch of nonsense. You don't need a point at all to shoot a bird. They actually, they actually preferred blunts because if it got in a tree or something like that, a blunt arrow will fall down. Or if it's got a point on it, Sometimes they get stuck and you don't get your arrow back, like squirrel hunting or something like that. So, anyway, but the the uh, flint collectors keep calling them arrow of bird points, and so I don't see any anything changing there. But um, crazy, they're actual. They killed each other with them. They killed bison. They killed deer. They killed everything with those little tiny arrowheads. That's just how it was. I mean, they find them that way. It's not for birds. What was the story on corner tank points then? Oh, that's still under conjecture. They, they could be just a prestige item, except they had found, you know, under a, a scanning electron microscope that they show wear and tear on them. It looks like maybe they were using them for basket making tools, maybe something like that. But it wasn't for putting a... Uh, a handle on because a handle at 45 degrees like that is totally useless. It was probably for attaching a string to wear around your neck. It was just a nice thing to own. You know, Indians like pretty things too, just like everybody else. You got a bigger knife than everybody else. You're you're the man for the moment. So that's my two cents. A lot of this is my conjecture, you know. I mean, you it's hard to prove things. Some, some things can't be proved at all to some people's uh, expectation. But at any rate, you can see nobody taught the Indians how to make a bow because it can't get any simpler. Somebody just got the idea. And it took hundreds, of, it took thousands of years to get popular. There were guys walking around had a bow and arrow two, 3,000 years before anybody else thought it was a good idea. So you know how that goes too. So at any rate. Thank you for inviting me, and y'all have a good evening, huh? Yeah, thank you, Jack. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks very much. And Seth, you send me a link for when you put this on YouTube. I will. I absolutely will, Jack. I'll get it, get it all edited, and then I will send it to you. Have a good night, Jack. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks everybody, for coming. Yeah, and thank you all very much for coming. I appreciate it very much. Yeah. <laughs>